Well, six o'clock, let's go ahead and get started. If you don't mind, I'll call this meeting to order if you're able. Uh, please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Dee, can you please call the roll? Director Yee. Present. Director Stewart. Yee. Director Stewart, you're on mute. You're still on mute. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm sorry, I am present. <laughs> Director Wallace. Present. Director Ethan. Present. Director Nicholson. I don't hear you. There he is. I don't hear you, Dr. Nicholson. Nope. No. 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 Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. Yeah, these glitches. Okay. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, D, who else is in the room there? Uh, in the room, we have Kimberly Hart, Tina Nunez, um, Chris Henry, Larry Labossier, Paul Kozachenko, Shri Baru, and Jean D'Antonio. Very good. Thank you. Well, welcome to the um, let me get this, April 13, 2022, regular meeting of the Washington Township Healthcare District Board of Directors to continue to protect the health and safety of the members of the board, district staff, and members of the public from dangers posed by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The Brown Act allows a local agency to continue to hold its meetings remotely as opposed to being required to meet in person. Section 54953E3 of the government code requires that the board makes certain findings every 30 days to continue to meet remotely. One such finding is that, quote, state or local officials continue to impose and recommend measures to promote social distancing, end quote. The Alameda County Health Officer continues to recommend social distancing and the wearing of masks indoors. I refer the public to the Alameda County Healthcare Services Public Health Department COVID-19 website at www.covid-19.acgov.org. I ask for a motion let the board make the finding required by section 54953E3B2 of the government code that quote, state or local officials continue to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. Madam President, I make the motion that the board make the finding required by section 54953E3B2 of the government code that's that state and local officials continue to impose a recommended measures or recommended measures to promote social distancing. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson. Roll call, please. Oh, Director Yee? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Very good, thank you. Public notice for this meeting, including dial-in information has been posted appropriately on our website. Tonight's meeting will be conducted by Zoom and I ask you to please mute your system until such time as you need to speak. We are recording tonight's regular session of the board meeting. It will be posted on our website for future viewing. I'm moving on to communications. Members of the public are invited to speak during oral communications. When prompted, please state your name for the record, then proceed with your statement not to exceed three minutes on issues or concerns not on the agenda and within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the board. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak at this meeting? <coughs> Hearing none, D, are there any written communications? There are not. Okay, we will now move on to our consent calendar. The consent calendar consists of those agenda items that the board will approve with one motion, unless either a member of the board or a member of the public requests to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar. If any items are removed from the consent calendar, the board will take action on the removed agenda item later in, 
in the meeting under the action item heading of the agenda. Does anyone on the board want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? No, does any member of the public want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? All right, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar items A through E, please? In accordance with district law policies and procedures, I move that the board of directors approve the consent calendar items A through E. Very good, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson. Okay, we'll have a roll call, please. Director Yee? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Okay, very good. All right, we get to move on to presentations and I'm really looking forward to learning about low back pain as I experience that, I'll be taking notes. Uh, look forward to uh, getting to meet Dr. Seigel. Uh, Kimberly, would you do the honors of, of the introductions, please? Uh, yes, Madam President. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Rajiv Seigel. He joined the neurosurgery team at Washington Township Medical Foundation and the Bell Neurosciences Institute in July of 2021. In addition, he's an associate professor and neurosurgeon scientist at the University of California, San Francisco. He's board certified by the American Board of Neurological Surgery. His experience includes training at Georgia Tech, Harvard University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, University of Miami, Scripps San Diego uh, Spine Foundation, and more. He was previously an assistant professor and neurosurgeon scientist at the University of Washington in Seattle. His work has been widely published in a variety of national and international publications, each focused on the latest in neurosurgery advancements and research. Dr. Seigel specializes in, in minimally invasive techniques in the treatment of spinal deformities, spinal tumors, spinal cord injuries, neurotraumas, and more. He has received several awards and recognition for research, te teaching, and scholarship, and is known for his patient-centric care. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Seigel. Thanks very much, uh, Kimberly. Let me uh, load up my slides. Um, hopefully you all can uh, see that. Um, it's uh, giving me notification, yes. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here and to talk to you all today. Um, the, as stated, the topic is on low back pain, um, which is extremely common, uh, something that almost all of us will face. And today I'd like to talk to you about when it's surgical and when is it not, uh, and to help uh, inform uh, the audience about uh, our thinking as neurosurgeons on this topic and uh, some of the red flag signs. And I'll, I'll, I'll do this talk in the context of cases. I think it's often easiest to think about this in terms of the story of uh, real people and uh, to help understand our thinking. So let's get started. So uh, here's the first uh, case I'd like to tell you about. Uh, this is one of a 36-year-old uh, male resident physician uh, who had low back pain. Um, this worsened over several months. Uh, there was no leg pain or weakness. And um, this coincided with a very busy period of uh, residency um, with the long hours um, and uh, standing up for uh, very long surgeries and doing one after another and many nights on call. Whenever we uh, encounter patients like this, we generally recommend conservative therapy first. And uh, that involves a, a battery of different things. Uh, we recommend rest when possible. There's a variety of uh, anti-inflammatory medications uh, that are possible. Um, we typically start with our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, simple over-the-counter things like uh, ibuprofen, Tylenol, et cetera. Um, and this uh, person did those things as well as use uh, inversion table and actually never needed any further uh, workup or uh, surgery. And one month after trying uh, these conservative therapies, uh, the pain result. Um, and this person is me. Uh, this is uh, low back pain that I suffered during the busiest part in my residency. I'm no longer 36, this was many years ago. But um, uh, I can relate to uh, many patients I see who have low back pain because I've dealt with it myself as, probably everyone in this audience has in some respect or another. 
And um, this is just one example of many times where it's not surgical and, and we can get some success with uh, non-surgical therapies. So um, the first point I wanna make is that most cases of low back pain do not need surgery. Uh, and the most common cause is what I experienced as a resident, uh, which is musculoskeletal strain. Um, and so here are just pictures of people doing common tasks that can lead to those sort of things. So occupational hazards are very common uh, as a cause of back pain. Here's a, a construction worker uh, showing some poor posture in a position that over time is very likely to cause some back pain. We see athletes uh, and uh, people um, who play sports, who lift weights. Um, sometimes the weightlifting is not in a gym, but actually just lifting something heavy in the home, uh, moving furniture, packing for a move, those sort of things very common cause of musculoskeletal strain. Uh, the picture on the right is another one I can relate to having three young kids and it's lifting uh, those children over and over again can also cause uh, some strain. The good news is again, almost uh, never will these things iso in, in isolation um, be a need for surgery, but that doesn't mean they don't need any treatment. And, and uh, often I see patients like this that we can help um, without surgery and with some of the things I just mentioned. So here are some of the non-medical therapies that are very typical. Um, and these are the therapies that we usually start with. So again, rest and avoiding triggers. So for example, um, in someone, let's say the construction worker who did a bad movement at work and uh, they feel like uh, the back is an excruciating pain. Um, well, that, that person can't return to work right away. They need a period of rest and trying to avoid the trigger um, and give their, their back a time to, uh, to recover. Um, for most of us who work at a computer for a large part of our, our day, uh, ergonomics makes a, a big difference. And it, you know, in the era of electronics, uh, many of us uh, are looking down at our phones, looking down at our laptops in a way that causes strain on our necks and can cause strain on the low back as well if uh, you're sitting forward and not having adequate uh, cushioning. So. Here's an example from a, a Purdue University site of showing good uh, ergonomics, looking straight at your screen, sitting up well, having good uh, cushioning, et cetera, um, and good low back support. Um, then taking a step up, um, other non-medical therapies uh, that often work, acupuncture works for many patients. Physical therapy uh, is prescribed to almost every patient that I see. Um, inversion table and, and related to that is traction, which is something I use basically inversion table just hanging upside down for a few minutes and then sometimes that can unload the spine. And then uh, TENS is, is a nice uh, therapeutic option. It's basically a nerve stimulator that uh, works uh, through the skin. So th these are actually available over the counter at, at most pharmacies. And um, sometimes they're prescribed by me and other surgeons as well. And basically patients can just put stickers over their back in places that hurt. and and use a controller to deliver stimulation in sessions that usually last a few minutes. So um, those are non-medical therapies. And of course we have a lot of medications uh, that can help as well. Um, we usually start with oral anti-inflammatories. I mentioned some, Tylenol, ibuprofen, et cetera. Uh, there are also steroids that are kind of stronger anti-inflammatories. Um, I frequently prescribe topical versions of those. Uh, th there's one called Volterin that I like a lot. Um, There's just a strong anti-inflammatory help some patients. The next step up would be uh, local injections, um, which I, I personally don't do, but uh, my partners at Washington do, and we frequently um, refer patients out for those when, when needed. Um, and neuropathic pain medicines like gabapentin are also very common in patients who have not just back pain, but pain that would radiate down arm or leg. Now you'll see in, in lighter color and, and with a line through it are opioids and muscle relaxers. These are sometimes useful in the short term. I think they're almost never useful in the long term. And of course, opioids have uh, a bad name associated with them now as they should. Uh, very addictive medications. Muscle relaxers can be addictive as well. I still prescribe them frequently in the post-operative period for short uh, term use. Uh, again, I think post-op pain for a week or two uh, is, is appropriate, sometimes a few weeks longer. Again, almost never uh, a good idea in the long term. So when is back pain surgical? Um, these are some of the categories uh, of patients 
who have a more serious condition that often need somebody like me. So it's one thing if you just have back pain, like I experienced as a resident. Um, it's another thing if you have your spinal cord being compressed or nerve being compressed because of a condition in your spine. Um, also a trauma, um, let's say you're in a car accident or fall down or have a sports injury and you fracture a vertebra of your spine. Well, that's a different situation than someone who just has back pain in isolation. And um, just because you have a trauma, even if you fracture a bone, actually, that doesn't mean you have to have surgery, but there are ways that we categorize that and determine whether a fracture is unstable or not. Um, it, certainly, you need to be evaluated by a surgeon if you have that. Then there's spine tumors and spinal deformity, which are more uh, technically complex to, to deal with, but those are often also areas where um, uh, patients end up needing surgery. So let me give you um, a few more examples. I'm going to start with the small, smallest uh, procedure we do and, and uh, go larger and show you also some of the biggest things that we do. So um, this is a, a case of patient I saw recently in clinic here, a 35-year-old uh, female patient with debilitating back pain. Uh, in, it was in the low back and right leg pain. So um, one thing that sticks out of this one is, again, it's not just low back, but it's also going to the leg. So that suggests that there might be nerve compromise there. And this patient also had weakness of the right leg. And um, when I assessed her in clinic, uh, her reflexes were abnormal in the right leg. So all of those things point to there possibly being nerve compression, and this type of patient definitely needs an MRI. So we got an MRI, and... Um, this is an MRI of the lumbar spine, and what I've circled shows a disc herniation. This is a disc herniation at the level of L5. Um, you can see my mouse, I'm pointing to L5. Down below is the sacrum or S1. And this part here is the disc, and it is touching the right S1 nerve. It's compressing the right S1 nerve before it can leave the spine. And that can really cause uh, uh, debilitating uh, pain and it fit perfectly with the location in her leg uh, where, where she was um, having the most pain. So even though she had this problem, we still try conservative therapy first. We never just jump right into surgery, um, <clears throat> it, it, except in, in very um, uh, different situations. And so for this patient, she tried a co course of steroids. She tried uh, gabapentin. She tried physical therapy, um, but none of those things sufficed for her. So uh, because she failed conservative therapy, she became a good candidate for surgery. So um, this is a, a case that today we can do through minimally invasive surgery. And I have this picture of the dime here to just sh show you a reference for size. A dime is about 18 millimeters in diameter. And we can do this whole surgery through an incision and uh, opening that is about the size of a dime. So we make a small incision in the back, we insert a tube that pushes the muscles to the side, we get down to where the disc is herniated, and then we use these instruments to take out the pieces of herniated disc. And a patient like this um, will generally go home the same day. The surgery will just take a couple hours, they go home the same day, they can be up and walking the same day. Um, and so the recovery is much faster than uh, surgeries that we used to do in more open and larger vests. Um, here's a, a case of a trauma, spine trauma, in a patient who definitely needed surgery as well. Um, this patient was an 83-year-old male who fell down and hit his forehead, and he initially could not move any arm or leg. He was completely paralyzed, but uh, thankfully for him, most of it was transient. It, it passed uh, and, and started to improve. He first started getting some strength back in his legs, um, and then in his left arm, um, and he came into the emergency department. And by the time I met him, he was moving the left arm and legs well, but he could not move the right arm at all. And, and he had decreased sensation of speed and he had a burning sensation in his arms. So he definitely needed uh, imaging and we got the CT scan and it showed this very dramatic fracture dislocation at the top of the spine. This is a level of C2. And this piece of bone should be connected to this piece of bone, but it's not because uh, he fractured the top of C2 and this uh, fractured C2 was sitting in his spinal canal. Very dangerous situation. This was compressing his spinal cord. This image is a CT scan. This other one is an MRI scan. 
and it shows the same thing in his spinal cord is being completely compressed by this. And so he had a spinal cord injury and that's why he was having the uh, paralysis. So this is a patient who definitely needs surgery to stabilize this and, and to uh, decompress his spinal cord. And so I took him for surgery. I, I realigned the spine and I, I put in um, this, these implants, screws and rods to stabilize him at C12. And he made a, a very good recovery. Uh, and in his final follow-up, he regained actually uh, almost all of his strength in his right arm and, and be, became independent as he was before. Um, here's another example of a degenerative condition that is common. This is a 65-year-old patient who came in with back and right leg pain. Um, we asked patients on a 10-point scale how bad it is. She said her back pain was 5 out of 10, leg pain the same, 5 out of 10. We also have a disability scale that we measure patients by, and on a 100-point scale, she was 39, which means disabled is really bothering her. It can be worse, could be a lot better, but it was, she's clearly disabled by this. And I, I like to have patients draw where on their body it bothers them. So she was showing me that it was radiating down her pain, excuse me, down her right leg. And um, this MRI scan is showing an instability. The, the medical word for this is spondylolisthesis, but the lay word is slip. Basically, her fourth lumbar vertebra, L4, was slipping forward on L5. And that can be very painful and can pinch the nerve that passes in that area. Uh, this is an x-ray that shows the same thing. When she stood up and bent forward, this would slip even more, almost another half a centimeter. And that was uh, a big cause of her, her pain in the back and legs. Um, we also ask the patients to rate how good or bad their health is. And uh, 100 means perfect health, zero means uh, the worst it could possibly be. And so she was rating her overall health very low because this was so debilitating. She was rating herself at a 40. Um, so this is the surgery I did for her. It was a minimally invasive fusion. Um, I stabilized the spine at L4-5 by putting in this implant, um, and I put in screws and rods at L4-5. This procedure is called a T-lift. Um, it's basically a type of spine fusion, and um, she was in the hospital for only two days, um, which is pretty short for what it's worth for a spine fusion. Uh, when we do these more open, patients can be in the hospital for four to seven days. So by doing this minimally invasive, it, it lowered her blood loss, it lowered um, time in the hospital, and, and she was faster to return to her activity. So after surgery, she re-rated her health, and now she was rating herself at a 90 out of 100. Her pain scores dropped down. Um, she went from being at five to being at one in the back and zero in the legs. And her disability score went from 39 to about 10. So she improved in all of those measures because of this minimally invasive surgery. Here's a tumor case. These are more complex. This was a 63-year-old patient with melanoma. He had already had a melanoma lesion taken off his leg in 2017. But now the new thing when he came to me was that he was having pain in his upper back for several months. Also felt like it was hard to find his footing. That's how he described it when he was walking. It's full strength, but he had abnormal sensation in his right leg and one of the reflexes was abnormal. So we got imaging and it showed this big tumor at T4. Basically, his melanoma had spread to his spine at T4, and it was pushing on his spinal cord and causing the symptoms I just mentioned. This is very dangerous because he was already affecting his ability to walk. If it gets worse, this is a patient who could become totally paralyzed. So um, this patient needs a, a larger surgery. I basically took out that uh, ver entire vertebra that had the tumor in it and replaced it with this expandable metal cage and then fused him three levels above and, and two levels below um, for stability of that fractured bone that was fractured by the tumor. Um, and then post-operatively, he made a good recovery. His walking was improved and then he could go on for his oncologic care, the treatment of his cancer. Uh, finally, I'd like to share with you another type of surgical case. This is a spinal deformity case. Um, this was a 67-year-old female patient who came to me with scoliosis and back pain. She had had this her entire life, but what had been bothering her more recently is she felt like she just couldn't stand up straight. She was leaning forward over four years. She just felt like it was getting worse and worse, and she couldn't walk as far as she used to. She was also having some shooting uh, pain down her legs, uh, uh, going into her thighs. And when I examined her, she had good strength in her legs, but she just could not stand up straight. And she was stooped forward. And because of 
standing that way, um, it was causing a lot of strain on her back. So we got x-rays and it showed this really dramatic curve. This is a very severe scoliosis with a thoracic or mid-back curve and a lumbar or low-back curve. And um, this is a side view. You can see when she stands, her head is way out in front of her, her sacrum and her pelvis. So this causes imbalance and it makes the low back muscles do a lot of extra work, which can be very painful. So again, we tried conservative therapy first, PT, meds, et cetera, but she um, failed conservative therapy. Those things were not enough for her and ultimately went for a very big surgery, which is a deformity correction. And so this is her post-op uh, X-ray and I fused her from T4 down to the pelvis, um, which you can see is most of the spine. And you can see how dramatic the posture is different. Now look, the curves are much less, both from the front and from the side. And this was very life-changing for her. She was able to do more activities. Um, she was able to walk further. She was able to um, do the things that she uh, was not previously able to do. Basically her activities of daily living, playing with her grandkids, going to the store, you know, the things that many of us take for granted. So, you know, in conclusion, um, back pain can be surgical for many reasons, but these are the ones that are most typical uh, for a spine surgeon like me to see. Uh, nerve or spinal cord compression, trauma, tumors, and spinal deformity. And uh, there's certain red flag signs that I mentioned in these cases. Uh, pain that is not just in the low back, but um, that goes to the limbs and particularly pain that worsens uh, with time and, and doesn't get better with, uh, with trying simple things, uh, conservative therapy. Limb weakness is a red flag sign, difficulty walking or imbalance, and difficulty controlling the bowel or bladder can be a sign that the spinal cord is compressed. So, um, you know, now in my Washington practice, I'm happy to treat patients with any of the above. Um, and one of the th many things I like about working and practicing here is that we can offer patients these type of surgeries that really range across the gamut from small to large. I, my, my clinical philosophy is always to do the smallest thing that is likely to benefit the patient. And like I said, many times that's not surgery at all. Uh, it, it, it could be giving them a medication, giving them a referral to physical therapy. But then even when we do do surgery, I'm always thinking about what's the smallest uh, target that I can go after with surgery that's likely to help them. And, um, and many times that's a minimally invasive case with a quick recovery. And once in a while, it's, it's something larger and we're happy to offer that uh, as well. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, I also in particularly wanna thank uh, Kimberly and uh, Tina uh, for inviting me, for organizing this and, and also for bringing me here in the first place. Um, uh, me coming here was uh, part of them being open to uh, a very strategic uh, partnership uh, between Washington and UCSF and a unique setup that, that allows me to do uh, some research there and continue my, to pursue my research interests in, uh, in spinal trauma uh, while doing uh, elective cases here and, and serving our, our Washington population. And uh, it's been a great move for me uh, so far and I've really, enjoyed uh, joining the, the team here. Um, so with that, I'd love to take any questions. No questions, just thank you very much. I'm so glad you're here in our area and our district serving our, our residents. It's very exciting. Thank you. Anybody else? Very good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Seigel. Look forward to meeting you in person but not professionally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. All right, then well, we will move on to our reports. Um, is Dr. Saleh on? Sorry, I there was muted. Is. There you go. <laughs> so glad that you're here for sitting in for Dr. Hyder. Welcome. We'll ha have your medical staff report when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Hyder's away today, and uh, I hope you guys don't mind me subbing in. Absolutely not. Um, 
So it's going to be a short report. Um, we had a doctor's day luncheon on March 25th that was uh, well attended by the medical staff and very much appreciated. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Ms. Hartz, the hospital administration and board for uh, the gracious uh, lunch and, and for everything that you do for the medical staff. Uh, we do feel the, uh, the support and appreciate it very much. Uh, we'd like to mention that the hospital census has improved. We had a very high census for the last several weeks and that has come down luckily. Uh, taking some of the strain off um, all the hardworking staff. Uh, as well, COVID numbers have improved significantly. We have very few um, inpatients right now with COVID. Hopefully it stays that way with all these new variants and subvariants that are out there, uh, but so far so good. And uh, finally, um, Washington Hospital is now offering vaccinations for uh, patients who are over 50 years old and for the immunocompromised uh, as a fourth in, uh, vaccine uh, or a second booster. Um, that is it. Any oh. questions? <laughs> <laughs> you weren't kidding. Thank you very no, much. You're very and, welcome. We're keeping it short and sweet. Well, happy belated Physician's Day. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, I have a question. Um, I'm confused about the length of time between, uh, assuming you're like, over 65, the length of time between your first booster and the second booster? Is there a... Uh, good question. Off the top of my head, I think it's a minimum of four months and maybe up to six months. But I think uh, currently it's available for everybody, assuming that they got their last booster uh, when they were due. So I, I believe um, if it's over four months, I think you would still, you would qualify. Yeah. The recommendation is four months yeah, by CDC. Yeah. Thank you. Four okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> very good. Make your appointments today. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Saleh. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. All right. Next up, our service league report from President Ferry. Welcome. Good evening to all the board from me and all the volunteers. Um, I'm going to go through this quick. <laughs> you March, too. <laughs> was an, <laughs> March was another busy month for the volunteers. Um, during a, the month, 101 volunteers contributed 1,301 hours on a wide variety of assignments from serving in the gift shop to assisting, you know, nursing unit assists in telemetry, oncology, and on in the Morris Hyman and also in the main hospital. Um, thankfully, the need for the service league to make COVID-19 test kits continued to decline in March. In February, volunteers assembled 1,600 kits, whereas in March, we assembled only 200. This is obviously a good news showing the dramatic reduction in COVID case rates, and hopefully it continues. Um, however, the volunteers kept busy assembling other kits, including 223 UTI kits for the ED and 325 diabetes ed education packets. Um, on April 9th, we also hosted an orientation session for prospective new volunteers. Um, there was six college and one adult attempted and will be joining the service league very soon. Um, the service league is beginning to rebound financially from the pandemic, which is yay, good news, um, with the increased sales in the gift shop and the return of masquerade. Um, our finances are more stable and we are now offering scholarships again to the grad. Yay, I'm very excited. That's something that we had to postpone last year and we're now able to do this year. And speaking of the masquerade, we're having the $5 masquerade jewelry sale. Um, this um, April from the 25th through the 27th. And of course we're expecting a large crowd and you know, where else can you buy a piece of jewelry for cheaper than a gallon of gas? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
And let's see, I think that's the end of my report. Is there any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. All right, we'll go into our lean report. I see Dr. Kata's on. Kimberly, will you do the introductions, please? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> this evening, we have Dr. Prasad Kata, who received his medical school training at Government Medical College, Bellary in India. He completed his residency in internal medicine in England in 1997. He came to the United States in 1999 and completed his residency at UNDNJ in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He completed his fellowship in endocrinology at Charles R. Drew University at UCLA in 2004. Currently, Dr. Kata is a practicing endocrinologist at Washington Township Medical Foundation and the medical director of diabetes at Washington Hospital Healthcare System. Dr. Kata has practiced in Fremont for the last 18 years, and when he's not working, he likes to hike, watch movies, and spend time with his family and friends. So thank you, Dr. Kata, for the presentation this evening on uh, the diabetes program. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> so. Uh, Will I be sharing the slides from my computer or? We can share it from here, Doc. Okay. I'm gonna give you a control. Thank you. So um, I think the last report if I presented, I'm not sure. It was probably, I think, in either 2020 or in uh, probably 2019, I think. I don't think we've had any presentation for 2020 or 2021. So the this is a the report uh, means uh, I've had a lot of help from uh, Lena and also the guest and also our uh, Diabetes Advisory Committee. Uh, so I have about maybe 25 slides or something like that. Let's uh, go through this. Hmm. It's not okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> with respect to, as we all know, the diabetes incidence and prevalence in U.S. only keeps getting larger and larger or more. Uh, it's the seventh leading cause of death in the United States, uh, and the number of people with diabetes. This is according to the CDC report card in 2019 about 37 million, 11.3% of the US population. And if you look at California by itself, more than 4 million, that is 13.4% of the adult population, which is higher than the national average. And the number of patients who were diagnosed was 28.7 million, and out of which is 28.5 million as adults. And undiagnosed is about 8.5 million, about 23% of the adults are undiagnosed. And if you come to pre-diabetes, which is even more a sobering figure, total about 96 million people above the age of 18 years. That is about 38% of the adult US population. And if you look at 65 and older, about 26.4 million people age about 65 and older, that's about almost 48% have pre-diabetes. So if you come to our local our tri-city area with respect to the community needs assessment, which was done in 2020, uh, diabetes was one of the most pressing community health needs for the hospital primary service area. And if you look at the diabetes hospitalizations per 100,000, Newark and Union City had a higher incidence of getting admitted to the hospital with diabetes compared to the Almeida County. Uh, for Newark, it was 1,844, and Union City was about 2054 per 100,000 patients, and Alameda County was about 1,700. And also, means as physicians, we always tell our patients, okay, please try not to go to the ER, please try not to go to the uh, go to, uh, get admitted to the hospital. The ED visits are also uh, higher for Newark. If you look at per 100,000, it's about 2890 and the county average is about 2674. And the California Department of uh, Public Health Chronic Disease Control branch that said that the prevalence in Alameda County 
in 2019, diabetes was over 9.2%. So with respect to the number of patients with, uh, since our prevalence itself is high in our uh, tri-city area, Washington Hospital Healthcare System, obviously the number of patients who we get into the hospital with diabetes as one of the either the primary or the secondary diagnosis is also higher. So if you look at this chart, uh, it starts from uh, QE, like uh, first quarter uh, 03 20, and it goes up till 12 21. It's pretty much uh, in about the 30% or slightly above the 30, mid 30s, low to mid 30% range. And uh, the bar graph itself shows the number of admissions. And the national average is in the footnote there, it's about 25% of patients admitted to the hospital. So what we have to do with respect to sort of helping with re reducing the number of admissions or ED visits, we came up with the comprehensive diabetes program. The diabetes program has been there for almost like 14 to 15 years. But at the same time, <clears throat> we wanted to revamp the program, include more physicians in our diabetes advisory committee and have a program charter and make it a interdisciplinary, uh, um, interdisciplinary sort of charter. So for that reason, we came up with a comprehensive longitudinal care program. Uh, we wanted to use the lean principles to operationalize best practices. And we also wanted to benchmark the quality data and the staff engagement and empowerment, uh, both to the staff and also the nurses and be a regional leader in diabetes. So how are we going to achieve it? So we wanted to have inpatient where it's an interdisciplinary approach, diabetes care in all areas, and also the transition care, identify the risk patients in the hospital, educate them, and again, connect them to the outside sources, including the outpatient diabetes. And the out, in the outpatient, we wanted the primary care follow-up with respect to the patients, self-management and training, and also community engagement. So the other way with respect to also being a, a leader in the, in the local area is by <clears throat> sort of checking off all the boxes for the Joint Commission Inpatient Diabetes Certification. So if you look at this roadmap, we see glucose and A1C on admission. Uh, I'll present another slide, a couple of slides later. Individualized interdisciplinary plan of care and glucose targets protocols and guidelines for reducing the hypoglycemia, low blood sugars and hyperglycemia, high blood sugars, uh, insulin therapy management, which in our hospital, we have a robust uh, pharmacy protocol, which cares for almost 90% of the patients, inclu including insulin pump and error prevention strategy, and also on discharge education to newly diagnosed uh, patients, arrange for follow-up within the first month if possible, even sooner, and share unresolved diabetes issues and the A1C with the outpatient providers. So coming to the inpatient, so A1C on admission. So why is our A1C very important? Again, A1C is a, a percentage of glucose for the last three months. Uh, the normal is less than 5.7 and someone who's diabetic is more than 6.4. And usually we want to assess the glucose control prior to the admission so that we can base our, uh, what, we can sort of uh, categorize the patient whether they fall under high risk, what kind of uh, inpatient education they need and who needs to see them and identify the patients who it's outpatient diabetic education after discharge. So the baseline data, if you look at in Washington hospital, we are seeing the three month average in about 75% of the patients. We want this goal to be at least 85 or above. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to update the admission order sets and also engage medical staff to get this to the goal uh, to 85 and 85% or above. So, we are also part of uh, Society of the Hospital Medicine. We joined Society of Hospital Medicine in, I think, uh, uh, the first quarter of 2021. 
So what does that help us with? It provides guidance on best practices, and it also is a benchmarking tool to rank our performance against other hospitals. Uh, it used the data to improve performance in not only in glucose control, but also in glucose safety. With respect to low hypoglycemia, which is low glucose and high glucose hyperglycemia. And also it has helped us a great deal in timeliness and management of low glucose, because we don't want patients to be having hypoglycemia or low glucose for too long in the hospital. So this is uh, some of the things we have sort of uh, achieved since joining uh, uh, the Society of Hospital Medicine, because with their data, we have sort of improved some of the path some of uh, the processes and I'll, I'll share with that share that with you in the next few slides. So the hypoglycemia management, if you look at in medical surgical uh, um, units, in uh, September 20, it was 51. And basically we want the glucose, when there's glucose less than 70, the next reading should be within 30 minutes after the patient has been given treatment. So that is what we want. And if you look at it, since we joined, we joined the Society of Hospital Medicine somewhere in uh, March 21. And since then, the graph has gone up and we are definitely in the goal and we are in the first quartile here. Same thing with the critical care. If you look at the critical care, we we're in the 50, percent, 50 percentile here. And right now we were 70.3 and the goal is above 70. So the hypoglycemia per patient day, um, if you look at it, we still have some work to do. Uh, in the medical surgical, the goal is less than 3.1. We are about 3.88. And in critical care and IMC, it needs to be less than 3.2. We are 4.0, but the trend is down, but we still have some work to do. Sorry. So this is uh, therapeutic glucose in range for patients in medical surgical unit and also the critical care uh, unit. If you look at it, we were actually doing fair, very well even before we joined the Society of Hospital Medicine and we are continuing to do that. Um, in the medical surgical unit, the goal is about 70.5, it's 78.6. And in the critical care unit, the goal is 77.9, and we are there. We were almost there, but we have achieved the goal and gotten into the first quartile, actually in uh, uh, December 2021 quartile. And the hyperglycemia per patient day, if you look at it, we are doing very well. Um, um, the goal is less than 7.5% and for the medical surgical unit and the critical care unit is less than 5.6%. So we are pretty much there except this one, one quarter here in the March quarter of 2021. It's not sort of very responsive, I'm not sure. Okay, next slide, thank you. Um, inpatient glycemic management. So what have we done with the hospital-wide education modules? We are trying to get them ready for 2022-23. Uh, the module includes case discussions about hypoglycemia, root causes and management, so that the nurses uh, and other providers know what exactly we need to avoid uh, in managing patients with diabetes and avoid hypoglycemia. Uh, we are also um, trying to get a insulin calculator, a bolus calculator that is basing the insulin requirements for patients based on what food they intake uh, and providing those parameter alerts prior to administration. So that way we don't need to give more, more insulin if they're eating less and so that the patients avoid hypoglycemia. Uh, and also with perioperative glycemic management, 
uh, we are want to follow the ISMP uh, standards for preoperative uh, self management or for managing the blood sugars. And ISMP stands for Institute of uh, Safe Medical Practice. Next slide, please. So again, inpatient glycemic management, uh, we have a centralized uh, EPIC patient list created for uh, interdisciplinary diabetes care. So what, what, what that list helps is it helps uh, the different uh, disciplines which take care of the diabetes, uh, identify the patients and care for them and see if they need the transition of care or outpatient management. And that includes the uh, dietitian, the pharmacy, the inpatient nurse educator, and also the case manager. So all these uh, disciplines are very important with respect to identifying these patients and taking care of the diabetes in the hospital and also connecting them to the outpatient. Next slide. Uh, so what do the nurse inpatient diabetes educator or we call them a certified diabetic educator, what do they do? They identify the patients and uh, they may basically give them diabetes survival skills. Uh, they see them usually once in the hospital, maybe at the most twice, because if they need insulin teaching, they help them with that. And again, uh, transition of care, they work with the case manager and make sure that the patient has a primary care appointment and uh, scheduling patients for outpatient education. So they touch upon all these bullet points, like what is diabetes, healthy eating, problem solving, and if they, have, if they do fall sick, what do they need to do? Long-term complications and the outpatient diabetes resources, et cetera. Next slide, please. So coming to the transition of care, um, again, as I earlier uh, um, sort of said with, it is a multidisciplinary approach with respect to treating diabetes uh, and all these uh, sort of modal, uh, uh, disciplines are involved. The pharmacist, the dietitian, the nurse, uh, diabetic educator, case management, the hospitalists and primary care doctors, and sometimes the endocrinologists. Uh, <clears throat> and we want a sort of a smooth transition to outpatient care and so all questions answered to the patient by the time they get discharged and they have they are plugged into the outpatient before they leave the hospital. So that includes the early discharge planning, like medication management, what medications they came in, do they need to be changed and what medications they will be going home on. Uh, they'll also need nutritional planning, uh, case management as to what uh, they need, whether they need insulin, uh, outpatient, uh, that they need uh, a monitor or test strips and lancets to check their sugars and anything else, and the inpatient uh, diabetes educators, and also the referral to the outpatient clinic. Next slide. So again, this uh, centralized uh, list plan, well, what we sh I showed you earlier, was before that, before we instituted that, the referrals from the inpatient to the outpatient were not that many. So since we introduced that in like uh, September 21, we definitely have increased it, the referrals by at least 50%. Uh, uh, and I think we want to continue that and get it even better. If you see here from October 21 to Feb 22, uh, the number of inpatients being referred to outpatients is definitely higher. Next slide. So coming to the outpatient. So we are actually a, both ADA certified and a speed success uh, certified uh, center. So the ADA certification definitely helps our patients for uh, diabetes self-management education and support. Um, and, and also we also do medical nutritional therapy and the outpatient diabetes center is actively engaged in community engagement Next slide. Yeah, so how does the outpatient uh, diabetes uh, um, education center work? It is mainly initiated by EPIC referrals. Um, um, physicians who use EPIC uh, can ref definitely refer patients through EPIC. 
Otherwise, if the paper, the referrals can come or paper or fax, patient also sometimes can get self-referred. Um, and as I um, sort of illustrated earlier, inpatient or patient referrals also happen when the patients are in the hospital. So how is the education delivered? It's uh, usually the uh, American Diabetes Association says, try and get class education as much as possible. But again, since we have a very diverse uh, population here, um, we may have to do one-to-one -one education too because of their language needs and other things. And uh, pump training and continuous glucose monitoring also uh, is being offered. And patients who have diabetes get medical nutrition therapy also. And we may also do other medical nutrition therapy for other reasons. And sweet success is uh, where we um, educate patients who have gestational diabetes, who have uh, diabetes during pregnancy. <clears throat> and that also is uh, either offered by class or one-to-one. -one. So again, this, these are all the bullet points for the curriculum. Um, it's again, diabetes disease process, nutritional management, physical activity, use of medications, and when to monitor your blood sugars, uh, treating and actually preventing and detecting and treating chronic complications and developing a personal strategy to address, uh, address both psychosocial concerns and also personal strategies to promote health and behavior change. So this slide uh, shows the number of patients who are being seen in the outpatient diabetes center. And in the uh, bar graphs is the number of patients. And in the line graph, if you see, this is the percentage of patients who are gestational diabetes. So a significant number of patients uh, do have gestational diabetes. So almost anywhere from 25% to almost as high as 55%. Again, that comes down to our uh, uh, diverse population here, which includes the South Asian Hispanic population. Uh, we do see a lot of gestational diabetes in our, uh, uh, in our community. And the right side of the um, slide shows that the pre and post education A1Cs, you see the benchmark here, the benchmark is um, before the education is 8.7%. And after education is about 7.38%. Uh, if you look at our data here, it's definitely better than the benchmark. And this starts from uh, uh, September of 2020 to December of 2021. Uh, pretty much across the board, I would say we are better. And again, this uh, in this, I would say the, the patients are being managed by the physicians too. In addition, the diabetes education uh, uh, um, center is also doing their work. So the A1C reduction happens both with the medication change and also with the education. And uh, the, with respect to the sweet success, we are monitoring the weight of the newborn. And that's one of the things we need to monitor for uh, sweet success uh, certification. Next slide. So um, how are we trying to improve our uh, outpatient uh, diabetes education? Uh, one is the referral, as I said earlier, uh, we want to increase the electronic referrals as much as possible and decrease the paper referrals and uh, standardize also the scheduling process. Um, and we also want to standardize the visit, the chart documentation via the visit navigator and enhance the patient experience, uh, provide continuous education and support community after the visit. <clears throat> so, um, we did do um, sort of that process improvement for decreasing the paper re referral by at least 20% by end of 1221. And we definitely achieved it. Uh, we implemented it here and it was 26.8% and it went down to 15.7%. Uh, um, and we want to try and achieve, try and get to less than 10% of the referrals of paper by QE. Uh, 622. Uh, and hopefully we are there. It's in the right track, but we'll have to see whether we'll be there or not. We want to be there, there in by QE 2022, mm -hmm. 6-2022. Next slide. So the other things the Outpatient Diabetes uh, um, Center does is the community engagement. 
uh, diabetes ma matter lectures are offered uh, every other month. Uh, health and wellness presentations, I think it's uh, twice a year. The Tri-City Voice article, and they also do a health fair uh, concert in the park and education to the students in Fremont Unified School District. So again, why is it important to educate the students? A recent study found that 18% uh, of US adolescents, one in five, and 24% of young adults had prediabetes during 2005 to 2016. Um, so for that reason, you, we want to educate our school um, adolescent children with respect to what is prediabetes versus diabetes and what is diabetes, information about uh, healthy lifestyle, eating healthy and exercise, and also the community resources. Um, <clears throat> again, if you look at about in 2018, about uh, 210,000 children and adolescents younger than 20 years were diagnosed with diabetes. And uh, uh, this number is only growing. And again, we have to do our part with respect to the community uh, outreach in reaching these, uh, this person, this age group and tell them on how to prevent the pre-diabetes and diabetes. <clears throat> so community engagement you know, helped to organize a fun run event program to promote exercise, discuss the importance of uh, healthy eating, um, preventing diabetes in a kindergarten class, and they also hosted a baking Zoom event due to on the COVID issues. Next slide. So what are the next steps? Uh, again, um, to continue to align the projects with Joint Commission and Society of Hospital Medicine recommendations and uh, uh, diabetes care protocols and guidelines in all care areas uh, <clears throat> and comprehensive education program Transition of care includes community social uh, diabetes self-management uh, and the goal eligible for joint commission inpatient diabetes certification by QE 1222. Uh, inpatient quality indicators, which I showed you earlier, the hypoglycemia management, we want to try and achieve 95% by June 2022. And the therapeutic goal at range, continue to maintain uh, the first quartile ranking uh, that is for both the uh, medical surgical units and also the critical care and hyperglycemia uh, goal management in the first quartile ranking and the hypoglycemia to be in the first quartile ranking uh, by 1222. So next steps is again, uh, outpatient improvement with the uh, uh, lean process to streamline the workflow um, and increase the volume from both inpatient or patient and also from the community providers. Uh, optimize the cycle time by decreasing the paper referrals and increase the patient experience. Uh, transition of care, monitor the process outcomes, identify barriers and implement solutions. And community outreach, again, uh, talk to the school age children education and implement process to ensure longevity of the program. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And I think uh, Lena and Tigas also probably are on the call. Thank you, Dr. Kata. Questions from the board members? Comments? No, no I, don't want to, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Kata and Lena Huang and uh, Tigas for their great work and in, in, uh, moving towards the inpatient certification and improving the quality of care for uh, diabetes within our hospital and within our district. It's a huge, huge challenge. So thank you for your great work. Thank you, Dr. Kutzer. Thank you. Yes. The education, but getting people to change the lifestyle and and diet, that's that's no easy thing to do. I mean, you see that diabetes, heart disease, getting people to change is, is very challenging. So we know that work is not easy, but it has pays great dividends. So thank you for all that you and your team are doing. Thank you. Very good. Anything else, anybody? 
Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Kata. We'll let you enjoy the rest of your evening. We appreciate your being here and sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on. I see Dr. Martin's on. Kimberly, would you like to introduce uh, Dr. Martin for her quality report, please? Sure. I know many. I know uh, Dr. Martin is familiar to many of the many of us. Uh, she is here this evening as the antimicrobial stewardship leader to present the report for the year. And uh, Dr. Diane Martin has been a member of Washington Hospital's medical staff since 1984. Dr. Martin has served in many leadership roles at Washington, including chair of the Department of Medicine and chair of the Clinical Evaluation Committee, which includes pharmacy and therapeutics and infection control. Dr. Martin has been a physician champion for our 5 Million Lives campaign, where she analyzed data and educated her peers on infection control issues, specifically MRSA. Dr. Martin attended medical school in Charleston, South Carolina, after which she completed her internship and residency at the University of Kentucky School of Medicine. She received a fellowship in infectious diseases at the UC uh, Davis School of Medicine. Dr. Martin serves as the board of direct on the board of directors of Life Elder Care, and she has been a member of the Washington Township Medical Foundation. And she has also been a key, uh, uh, what should I say, collaborator and resource for the whole healthcare system. Uh, especially during the pandemic, and has spent countless hours working with infection control and many other departments. So I know she's here for, as the antimicrobial stewardship leader, but I also want to recognize all she's done for the healthcare system uh, during COVID, too. So thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you. Um, you can hear me okay? Okay, good. Yes. Um, and Dee, I appreciate you're going to drive the slides for me, so I'm not that techie oriented. So. First slide. So we want to go over our antimicrobial stewardship program, and it covers a number of sections. And this is very important because there are more than 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infections per year. And if you include C. diff, which is a common colon related um, infection, it's almost up to 3 million. So it's definitely got impact on our healthcare system. And if we can improve this, then patients go home sooner, they live longer, healthier, and we have more resources to develop to other programs like our diabetes program. And I have to give a huge shout out to Lena because she also is my co-partner with this and it's been an enormous help. And you'll see a lot of tracking of what we're doing back and forth here. So she's in the background, it's probably not saying much, but she's been a huge help. We also see antibiotic resistance causing almost 35,000 deaths per year, which I think many of these could be avoidable if we were able to tailor our antibiotic usage a little bit better. Uh, the CDC collaborative studies indicated that this cost our nation almost 4.6 billion per year, just on six of the multi-drug resistant organisms. So it's a huge impact on our economy, also on our health of our friends, our family. Uh, next slide. So part of this comes in the development of resistance to certain antibiotics. So even though we come up with newer ones, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of the resistance developing faster and faster. So if you look at the penicillin resistance, that was developed in about 34 years, and the vancomycin was in about 30 years. So if you come down to the bottom, it's the time frame is getting shorter and shorter that we're developing resistance. So these antibiotics have less of a benefit for our patients because the bacteria are developing resistance. So the daptomycin, which is one of our go-to drugs for very resistant staph infections, has developed resistance within a year. And the septazamine avibactam developed it with only in about nine months. And this another one is one that I'll show you a little bit later on. So it doesn't mean that 100% of the bacteria are resistant, but we're seeing growing resistance in each of these areas in faster and faster. Uh, next slide. So this shows you a little bit of information about the resistance trends. So even though a bacteria may be resistant, it's not gonna be 100% resistant. And the question is, what can we do to try to improve on this? And antibiotic stewardship is one part of that. So we're using the antibiotics more judiciously. We're seeing our resistance begin to improve even though it looks very slight. So if you look at the E. coli, which is on your left side, we started to see when the levofloxacin was developed in 1999, uh, it worked about 93%. 
Then we sort of went down to 211, which is about 10 years later, we're starting this to see at about 64%. But when we actually pull back and use this drug more specifically for what it's truly indicated for, keep it for the resistant organisms that it was designed for, we can see our sensitivity improving to about 75%. Now it's not 100, but we are definitely seeing with conservative use of the antibiotics, using them where they're needed, or as appropriately as long as they're needed for the right dose, for the right patient, for the right infection, we're starting to see our sensitivity improve. And again, with the staff also, we see MRSA. So in, in in 1999, we were seeing about 61% resistance that dropped down into the low 40s. Now with our pullback and using these more specifically when truly needed, and I'll show you a slide, a couple from here, how we're actually doing that here at Washington Hospital. We can see our sensitivities. Now it's not a huge improvement, but it's definitely going in the right direction. Next slide. So this is one of our worst nightmares is carbapenem resistant organisms. Carbapenem is a, an antibiotic that's used for the most resistant bacteria. So we really hold on to this until we really, really need it. And unfortunately, we are seeing more and more resistance to this particular antibiotic for these types of infections. So it's called carbapenem resistant pseudomonas, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter. Most of these have been outbreaks in long-term care facilities. So I'm happy to say we've not seen any in our facility, but we are on the high alert for this. And I'll show you again in the next slide. So if you look at, this is the map of California where we're seeing resistance to this. There's much more resistance kind of in Southern California and also more to the Eastern part of the um, uh, state. Ours, if you're looking on the very left of that thing, the very light kind of blue side is our Alameda County. So we have one to about 10%. So the numbers are low, but we hope to keep us out of the dark blue and the gray zone. Okay, next slide. So Anvacopus Jewish is also endorsed by a number of organizations. So California Public Health has implemented um, a program to support us. Um, the Joint Commission also requires this as one of their benchmarks that they look for, how well we're doing in this, what we're what areas are we tackling? What problems do we see? How are we addressing that? CMS has also made this a priority for antimicrobial stewardship. CDC has a lot of help for us, and they have been very supportive in all the programs in our hospitals, as well as across the nation. Even the White House is behind us in trying to present national action plans to help evaluate and combat antibiotic resistance. Next slide. So what's our program goal? Next slide. Obviously we wanna optimize how well we're gonna be using antibiotics. And what we're using is a benchmark called a SAR, which is Standardized Antimicrobial Administration Ratio. So this gives us a benchmark within our institution across California, as well as nationwide, how well we're doing this. And the data is collected by NSHN, um, which is National Health um, Safety Network, which is part of um, CDC helps benchmark across the nation. So this is one is average, less than one, better than average, above one, worse than average. So you can look at starting at the 20, early part of 2020 all the way to the end of 21 we're doing a little teeny bit better as we're going along you see a little teeny bump ups and that's where we were seeing the surges for the um covid when we really didn't know exactly how well or what we could really do to manage it so we were throwing in every antibiotic we had hoping we could make these patients better that was before remdesivir so what we're seeing is we're getting a little bit better. We obviously like to continue to improve, but what we're doing looks like this trend for our hospital, this is ours, is doing moderately well. Next slide. So when I'm gonna give you two examples here, one of gram positive organisms and one of fungal organisms. Um, we actually did one for the gram negatives and did really, really well. So I didn't put that in there. I was, I was going to brag, but I decided not to. Anyway, so gram positives are even like your staph and your strep. And what we really worry about is the methicillin-resistant 
staph aurea. So if you look back on the previous slides, methicillin is a particular antibiotic for staph. And if a staph becomes resistant to that, we have very limited, daptomycin was one of them, one of those antibiotics to control it. So what we have done is to institute in guidelines for patients who have pneumonia, which is very controversial because we see a lot of patients coming from our skilled nursing facilities into the hospital. A lot of your elderly who have pneumonia, they can't produce sputum so that you can do a culture so you can see, well, what is the cause? Sometimes blood cultures will help you, but not always. So what we do is we worry they have the worst possible infection and give them vancomycin when it might or might not be appropriate. So what we have reached out to is called an MRSA, so methicillin resistant staph aureus PCR swab. So PCR is polymerase chain reaction. So these are bacteria that produce very tiny amounts of resistance and we can do a swab using PCR, which, which is basically like um, a photocopier for the antigen. So it boosts the pickup if you will, looking at patients who have MRSA infections. And what we're doing is a nasal swab. So we have a very high correlation between the swab, which picks up MRSA, and a patient who truly has MRSA. So if the swab is negative, then it's highly likely that they don't have MRSA, and vancomycin is probably not indicated. So what we did was look at across the board, the number of patients where we got the MRSA and then were able to then discontinue the vancomycin, therefore using that medication appropriately. So this is looking at our units. So the pink one is IMC, which is intermediate care. And unfortunately it looks the worst, but the problem is that's a very, very small unit it's one that's in flux. So there are patients coming from the medical surge unit going to IMC as a higher level of care. We're seeing a lot of patients coming from intensive care unit who are very sick, stepping down to intermediate care before they're ready to transition to the floor. So that's our pink line. But overall, you see the pink dotted line shows that we are making some improvement. The gray line is med surge and the blue line is, is um, CCU ICU. So they are really our champions about trying to make sure that we're using things appropriately. So again, we're holding right about one. The IMC is a little bit above, but again, that's a very challenging group that we're going to now go forward and try to figure out, okay, now we know the target area we need to work on, that's gonna be probably one of our next projects. Okay, next slide. So this is antifungal. So again, you can see the, the wide variation in the pink, which is IMC. And again, it's a very diverse group of patients that we're trying to sort of figure out how can we best manage those. Um, the, the blue is the um, ICU, CCU, and the sort of gray, brown, a dark color is the med surge. So what we looked at was a laboratory test called beta D glucan. And this is a protein marker that's found on many of the fungal infections. So this is a blood test that we can use for a patient who are suspecting has Canada and possibly a resistant Canada. Canada is one of the fungus infections that we look at and we tend to see most commonly. A lot of times there are patients who have been on antibiotics and so basically the, the bacteria are gone, the Canada is left, or a lot of times in our chemo patients we see that. Um, and so one of the drugs we're using is a kind of candin, which is a very strong drug used for resistant Canada, resistant aspergillus. So we're using the beta D glucan as a marker because that test will come back much faster than our blood culture tests come back. And that will take, usually blood cultures for Canada take three, four days. Sensitivity for Canada takes another three, four days. So we're using these high, high resistant bacteria, I mean, uh, antibiotics when it might not be needed. So the beta D glucan can tell us if we have that Canada in the bloodstream or in the culture. So we're using that as a blood test to see if the acondocannons are needed. So what we wanna do is to make sure if the acondocannon uh, the beta duclican is negative, then we were going to change from a condocannon to a different antifungal. We also, for patients that have positive blood cultures, we take these catheters out 
um, as they are sometimes a focus of the infection. And they were also rechecking the blood cultures every 24 to 48 hours to make sure that we're clearing the infection in patients who have the positive blood cultures. So those are two areas where we're usually working with the lab using markers that we can use to try to help guide our antibiotic use. And those are sometimes in in infections like the MRSA, that's hard to detect because it's not in the sputum, it doesn't show up in the blood as often. And then also for these fungal infections where it takes quite a long time to get the results and that way we can streamline the antibiotics, you know, even before the blood cultures come back. Next slide. This is talking about C. diff. Um, so that's Clostridium difficile, which is almost always found in the intestinal system. And this is a commensal. It can be in the intestine, the colon, as just a bystander, if you will. And many times we see in patients who have had antibiotics, which will go through and basically get rid of all the normal bacteria, this is what's left. The C. diff then can cause a very severe reaction within a patient, causing severe diarrhea, severe volume depletion, low blood pressure, and they get very, very ill. So what we were using as a, a um, toxin assay to try to help, what we do is a PCR is the first line of defense. They are preliminary chain reaction, looking for small amounts, amplified, photocopying those. The, then we then implemented another one called an immunoassay, which is much more specific. So many times people can be a carrier for C. diff and they are what we call colonized. So what we're trying to do is differentiate those between those who are colonized with C. diff, which probably don't need to be treated, versus ones who have infections with C. diff who definitely need to be treated. And this immunoassay was helping guide us. So you can see the number of ones that we were treating actually went down dramatically because we were able to sort out between colonized and truly infected. So we we're able to sort of tailor down and you look at that. So next slide. Back to the carbapenem resistance that I mentioned to you a little bit later. So we're very proactive. Again, we don't have these in our facility, but we don't wanna wait till it comes. We wanna be on the guard right away up front. So we do screening procedures, especially for patients who are coming from long care uh, facilities because they can be carriers for the carbapenem resistant infections. Um, we also check all of our infections looking for resistance and those are reported through our infection control team and to um, uh, the ID docs as well. We develop treatment guidelines specifically for this group of patients. The other thing is the nurses are very proactive in making sure that any of these patients that are suspected or truly have this, they're put in isolation and they are stay in isolation for the entire hospitalization. So we wanna make sure that there's no potential for spread. The other thing that the nurses do is those nurses have one on -one one nurses. So they're not going back and forth and shift changing and doing different things where different people are coming in and out. So they limit the exposure from our staff to those patients. So Alameda County is also high alert in terms of isolating and notifying facilities when they have a carbapenem resistant acinita factor and the carbapenem resistant pseudomonas. So there are multiple things that we are, have in place, preventative maintenance to make sure that when, if, when, I'm sure it will be when, we get it, we are ready and prepared. Uh, next slide. So, Everyone wants to know about COVID, so I threw in a little bit of COVID data for you as well. So right now we are looking at treatment guidelines for COVID. We look at the severe, which are ones that require hospitalization, mild to moderate, which may be mildly ill, and then also what we call pre-exposure. So these are basically caregivers, sometimes physicians, sometimes also caregivers in the home where somebody has um, COVID or potential for COVID and the caregiver or the physician may or may not have been able to be vaccinated or has a poor immune response. Say somebody who's got um, cancer treatments, somebody who's got rheumatoid arthritis is being treated with um, hydrosuppressive drugs. So the mild to moderate, we're looking at uh, Paxlovid, which is an oral medication, which is a combination of two medications the nemotimavir and ritonavir, which are antivirals. And then there's also monlopiravir, which is another um, oral 
um, available in the community. Um, initially, they were only distributed in Alameda County to the hospitals. Now they're more available. Some of the Safeway, some of the Walgreens, some of the um, CVS have those, and the physicians can call in prescriptions to those. There is a very new monoclonal antibody because Dertovimab, which was our go-to monoclonal, basically was pulled back by the FDA and their EAU rebuked because they were developing resistance. So we have belatilumab, which we have only very small, about 10 doses. So we are very stingy with that one because we want to make sure that this is truly appropriate, just like we are appropriate antibiotics for our, our gram positives, for our antifungals. We want to make sure we're very appropriate for our COVID infections as well. The carbacizumab and debimab was also pulled back from the um, FDA because it was not felt to be appropriate. So the pre-exposure that I mentioned at the tetzacivimab, sevimimab, which is Evisure, is pre-exposure. So this is somebody who is potentially exposed and wants to be treated with a monoclonal before they come in contact with patients. So sometime a physician who either can't take the vaccine or has another immunocompromising illness, uh, that's for these. So generally this is administered in our um, infusion center and there's a schedule for this depending on the, the type of infections that they can do. Originally this was developed for caregivers in institutions um, like nursing homes, long-term care facilities, um, prisons or areas where they're incarcerated, where they can't always predict who they're going to get exposed to. So we have this available. The physicians can write the orders. They can send it over to the um, infusion center, and those will get set up and coordinated for them. Next slide. OK, so this is pretty much just going over our monoclonal um, uh, and IV and oral antivirals that we've been using. Um, so we've seen about a 280 patients just in the last about 15 months. Um, so what we're looking at is of those that were treated, you know, we're hoping to treat them so that they don't need to be admitted. We ended up with 10 being hospitalized for various reasons. Um, they had received the monoclonal antibody and then just continue to progress on their illness. So 10 out of 280, not so bad, but we're trying to reduce that number. Those patients were a little bit on the older side in their 70s. Average living to say was not too bad, only 5.6 days compared to some of our other ones. So you can see the purple, Stratobamab is what we were using a lot of. We pulled back on that. Monopiravir is a very good oral drug. We expect to expand the use on that and because those have now become available through local pharmacies. And then the carbacizumab and Debamab we had used for prophylaxis basically is no longer available either. Uh, next slide. So this is looking at our ICU admissions um, that we've been doing, and, and we broke it up into the two sections. So the March 20 to February 21 is where there are very few patients that we were seeing had been vaccinated. March 21 to January 22, um, more were being vaccinated. So if you look at the on the bottom of the right section, the blue are ICU admissions. They pretty much parallel the admissions. You can see the surges that we had in July of 20, and then the December 20 that we see the huge surge, and then again, the surge again in the summer. So hopefully the surges are getting smaller as more and more people become vaccinated. If you look on the left side, we look at age and gender. Uh, so they pretty much match between the two um, calendar sections, but you can see the numbers are much smaller for the March 21 to January 22 section. So some of this was also improvement in our ICU staff as they became much more um, uh, familiar with trying to manage these patients. Um, their treatment became much more streamlined. So I think that was a big part of this. And also there was another tuzacizumab, another um, monoclonal that we were using to treat some of these patients. So that was used. And so there are, I think, multiple factors in here. I guess the bottom line is we are improving. And I think it's a tribute to the hospital as much as coordination as they have provided. The nursing staff are taking care of these patients, the ICU docs, low the ID, other ID docs that I work with and also our hospitalists because they are really challenged with trying to maintain care for these COVID-related patients. 
Uh, so you, the hospital, you should be very, very comfortable that you have a huge team that's behind every single one of these patients, multiple disciplinaries providing the best care for our patients. Uh, I think that's the last slide and I can take questions now or if we're running a little behind time, if you wanna send some in the chat box or just email me, I'm more than happy to take um, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. I give you a gold star for being able to pronounce all those antivirals. <laughs> I was practicing. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job, my goodness. It's like, it's like a long list of consonants and maybe a vowel thrown in every there. <laughs> you did a good job, but thank you so much for your, your hard work in, in this field of making sure that we have the right medication for the right treatment. Appreciate that very much. Okay, thank you. And I thank the board support. I mean, you have been behind us all the way. And I think that means a lot to the staff and to the physicians. Thank them all. Okay, thank you. Very good. Okay. okay. There's no questions, I'll sign out. And like I said, I can take questions later. You can call, email, chat, whatever works. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Dr. All right. Bye. Great. Um, okay, move on to our finance report with Chris Henry. Good evening, Good sir. Evening. Thanks, Director. Uh, tonight we'll be reviewing Washington Hospital's operating and uh, financial results for February. Um, acute inpatient statistics pretty high. Um, uh, we've got our inpatient average daily census 16% higher than budget uh, for the month at 178.0. Um, and our combined average daily census, which includes our outpatient observation days, 18% um, uh, higher than budget at 188.3. Um, admissions were 38 below budget at 764, but patient days, um, again, 16% higher than budget at 4,985. Our outpatient observation equivalent days for the month, um, 122 higher than budget at 288. And our average length of stay, as you might expect from these numbers, 19% um, higher than budget at 6.38 days. Uh, moving into utilization case mix index, um, higher than budget at 1.604. That may account for a lot of those long lengths of stay. The, we have really sick patients in here, really were impacted by COVID in February. Uh, deliveries were 20 below budget at 88. Surgical cases were 83 higher than budget at 392. Our cath lab cases were 11 higher than budget at 216. Outpatient visits uh, came in at 7,047, um, 199 higher than budget. And the ED uh, was 307 visits more than we expected at 3,855. Looking at the details of the uh, surgery uh, suites in the cath lab, um, really in the uh, operating room, uh, all of our major product lines higher than budget. Um, uh, joints, of course, have been really driving a lot of this, uh, 27 higher than budget. In our other category, uh, really uh, was busy at 43 higher than budget. In the cath lab, uh, also higher than budget across uh, most of our major product lines with the exception of cardiac. Cases we, we had at this point in the budget expected to have uh, a new uh, interventionalist on the staff. Um, that has not come to fruition yet. We, uh, we do uh, have numbers in the budget for that, um, and those numbers are ramping up through the year. So we're likely to see this variance uh, through the rest of the year. Um, as again, uh, we were highly confident that we'd have a new person here at this point in time, but it has not come to fruition yet. <clears throat> Looking at operating indicators, productivity, um, a lot of FTEs in the month. Uh, productive FTEs, 162.8 higher than budget at 1,497.9. We had 136.6 non-productive FTEs uh, for the month. That was lower than budget. So we end up uh, 130.5 FTEs in total, uh, higher than budget at 1,634.5. Our productivity measure, which is our full-time equivalents per adjusted occupied bed, 
uh, came in 0.81 lower than budget at 5.85. So even at those levels, we were operating uh, lower based on the activity than we had uh, anticipated. A lot of that has to do, I think, with some of the struggles with finding staff. I think Larry would attest to that. Uh, moving into the financials, um, this is our Governmental Accounting Standards Board presentation. Uh, this is the presentation required for us for our audited financial statements. With all that activity in the house, total patient revenue came in 14.6% higher than budget at $194,541,000. Contractuals for the month came in uh, at 78.29% versus 77.66%. We'll take a quick look at that. Uh, really driven by the payer mix for the month, um, government payers, uh, government sponsored pay payers made up 74.6% of our gross revenue in the month. We'd expected 73.1%, so that is not favorable for our, for our net revenue. Um, PPO was pretty close to budget, but HMO was half of what we uh, normally see and what we had anticipated at 1.3%. Uh, so we end up with contractuals uh, about 17% higher than budget versus the 14.6% gross revenue variant. So again, a higher level of contractuals being driven uh, by that payer mix. Um, private pay for the month came in lower than budget at 1.5%. We budgeted 1.9% and our provision for bad debt and charity came in uh, uh, really quite favorable at $1,740,000 uh, versus a budget of three point, almost $3.2 million. So again, our total deductions uh, from revenue net were 15.6% higher than budget at $152.3 million. And again, uh, total contractuals at 78.29%. Um, so we end the month um, with our op operating net revenue coming in 11.5% higher than budget or almost $4.4 million at $42,688,000. Expenses for the month, however, came in higher than expected with all the activity going on in the house. The real story there is our salaries and wages, which were $4 million higher than budget um, uh, at um, – really driven by the, the need to, first of all, we had a lot of activity in the house that drove our FTEs up, um, but a lot of that time had to be filled with overtime. You know, like everyone else, we were having a lot of recruitment problems. Overtime for the month amounted to about $3.2 million, and of that overtime, the premium portion amounted to $1.6 million. So really a struggle uh, with with the long length of stay and the number of people in the house and trying to keep things staffed properly uh, cost us a little bit more money in the month. Um, benefits uh, offset those high salaries. The, they were down about $838,000, uh, largely driven by our health and welfare claims. Uh, they were down $963,000. Those were offset um, by um, actually higher in uh, employer taxes being driven by that uh, higher level of salaries and wages. Um, supplies were about $754,000 higher in budget, and again, that's all the activity in the house. Um, we were above budget in prosthesis, reagents, cardiovascular supplies, PPE drove a lot of the variants, um, general surgical and medical supplies, uh, uh, all higher than budget. Those were uh, offset by a favorable variance in our uh, our drug costs. They were lower by about 234,000, and that was due to lower use of remdesivir in the month with these COVID patients. I, were, I don't believe that the patients are, while they're severely ill, they're not as severely ill, and we were not using as much remdesivir. Pro fees, professional fees for the month were 303,000 higher than budget. Uh, and um, the majority of that relating to the work we're doing uh, with clinical intelligence and trifecta. Um, and then our person services for the month were $164,000 higher than budget. Um, I'll wait for the page. Um, largely driven by recruitment costs. With the difficulty we're having find, uh, finding uh, 
employees, it's really driving our uh, recruitment costs higher. So those costs for the month were $144,000 higher than expected in the budget. So we end up the month with um, an, an operating loss for the month, unfortunately, of $833,000. Uh, and while that is a loss, it is a little bit lower than what we expected in the budget at 960000 Non-operating income for the month um, came in uh, at $171,000 loss. We'd expected a, about a million dollar positive number here. Uh, we did have um, uh, an unrealized gain, or excuse me, loss in our investments of $715,000, driving the ma majority of that variance. So we end up uh, April, or excuse me, February, uh, with a total bottom line showing a loss of uh, a little bit over a million dollars. We'd expected uh, $71,000 in income for the month. Taking a. Okay, now we'll take a look at our FASB presentation. This is um, the Financial Accounting Standards Board presentation. This includes adjustments to that GASB presentation that the financial markets might uh, make to those uh, when they take a look at it. The first thing we do is we reclassify our revenue bond interest expense of about 524, excuse me, $574,000 out of the non-operating category and up into operating expenses, which is where FASB likes to see it. So we end up uh, the month with total operating expenses of $44,095,000 sorry, $44, uh, from a FASB perspective and an operating loss of a little bit over $1.4 million. Um, we then, FASB does not recognize nice. our um, general obligation bond interest expense or the tax revenue uh, that supports the, the maintenance of those bonds, nor do they recognize that unrealized loss on our expenses. So we pull those numbers out and we end up with non-operating income from a FASB perspective of $834,000 against a budget of a million three, uh, and net income, excuse me, showing a loss for the month of 573,000 from a FASB perspective. Quick look at earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, this gives us an idea of the kind of income that the operations and non-operating activities are generating. Um, we look at our expenses before depreciation because depreciation is a really largely a non-cash accounting entry that recognizes uh, capital cash flows that happened in the past. So we pull that number out, we, uh, uh, those operating expenses, and come up with about $3,053,000 of income uh, uh, coming from our operations. We then move down to our non-operating section, uh, and we look at that before our interest expense, um, and those non-operating activities generated about $1,560,000 so in total for uh, February, uh, Washington Hospital's operating and non-operating activities generated about $4.6 million to go towards future capital expenditures, program development, and uh, various other sorts of activities. So are there, are there any questions on February? Okay. All right. I will move on to uh, the preliminary uh, for operations report for March. Uh, you'll see that there are some areas that uh, we continue to be busy, so we'll we'll begin. Uh, gross revenue of 209 million for March was above budget by 10 million, or 5 percent, and above March of 2021 by 25.3 million, or 13.8 percent. Inpatient gross revenue of 121.5 million was below budget by 18.9 million or 13.5%, but 6.8 million or 5.9% above March of 2021. Outpatient gross revenue of 87.6 million was above budget by 28.9 million or 49.2%. 
and uh, 18.6 million or 26.9% above March of 2021. Uh, and just to put it in perspective, in terms of our COVID numbers, we did see uh, a large decrease. In March, we had 50 COVID-19 discharges representing 6% of total discharges. And this re represents a decrease from the prior two months, which averaged 161 COVID-19 discharges. So uh, we sort of turned that corner in, in March. Moving on to the key statistics, average length of stay of 6.01 was above the budget of 5.46 by 0.55 or 10.1%, and above March of 2021 ALOS uh, of 5.7 by uh, 0.31 or 5.4 percent. Outpatient observation days of 317 were above budget of, of 231 by 86 days or 37.2 percent uh, and 72 days or 29.4 percent above March of 2021. Uh, moving on to the inpatient average daily census of 164.5, it was below budget of 169 by 4.5 days or 2.7%, but 25.6 days or 18.5% above March of 2021. Uh, and this is really driven by the lower admissions in the month. Then if you combine average daily census, um, which is the outpatient observation days and the inpatient daily census, uh, we have 174.7, which was below the budget of 176.5 by 1.8 days or 1%. Um, but it was 27.9 days or 19% above March of 2021. The average length of stay uh, for, the co for the 50 uh, COVID-19 patients discharged in March was 12.6. Um, in March, there were 15 discharges. Um, and with lengths of stay greater than 30 days, ranging from 31 to 81. And if you excluded uh, those, uh, then the average length of stay was 5.21. Uh, we still, do, though, I it have in-house a, a number of patients um, at the end of this month. We had 12 with lengths of stay of over 30 days, and they range basically from 32 all the way up to 313 days. So we have... Uh, um, number of patients with uh, long lengths of stay. Uh, moving on to our admissions, admissions were below budget by 159 or 16.6%. .6%. Admissions for the month were 8 or 1% above March of 2021. And in March, only 6.8% or 14 cases of the total joint replacement cases were inpatient compared to what we had uh, budgeted, which was 15.6% or 55 cases. So continuing to see that, that movement to uh, the outpatient. Looking at the patient days, uh, patient days of 5,100 were below budget by 139 or 2.7%. The average length of stay was higher than budget by 10.1% or 0.55, but emissions were below budget by 16.6%. So the average days for the month were 795 or 18.5% above March of 2021. All right, uh, now looking at our surgical trend, uh, total surgeries in March of 442 were above budget by 89 or 25.2%. Uh, surgical volume was 50 or 12.8% above March of 2021. Inpatient surgeries uh, at um, 167 were 34 or 16.9% below budget but 7 or 4.4% above March of 2021. Our outpatient surgeries at uh, 275 were 123 or 80.9% above budget and 43 or 18.5% uh, above March of 2021. And, and as I've noted in the past, uh, we had budgeted for um, a number of the outpatient joint replacement cases to begin migrating to Peninsula Surgery Center uh, in October of 2021. Uh, that is, uh, Surgery Center is still pending accreditation, so we're expected uh, that that migration will happen later on uh, in this year. I do want to note uh, the, the uh, amount of surgeries, the 442 for this month, uh, it, it seems to be uh, the highest um, number of surgeries that we have seen um, since uh, July of 2013. 
There was uh, a time when uh, when there was an issue with the flood over at the Washington Outpatient Surgery Center, and we did have a lot of extra cases. But um, besides that one, this has really been the highest uh, uh, level of surgeries we've seen in a month since uh, July of 2013. And we've also, as I move on to the surgical activity and the breakdown, you will see we did 205 uh, joint replacements, and this is the highest level of joint uh, replacements that we, surgeries that we have done. So uh, they were above budget by 81 or 65.3% and were 39 or 23.5% above of March of 2021. Uh, neurosurgical cases were also above budget by 4 or 14.8% and were 13 or 72.2% above March of 2021. Our cardiac surgical cases were above budget by 1 or 7.7% and were consistent with March of 2021. And all other uh, surgical cases combined were above budget by 3 or 1.6%, but 2 or 1% below March of 2021. So very uh, high surgical activity uh, for this month. Uh, moving on to the cath lab, uh, cath lab cases for March uh, at 233 were 20 or 9.4% above budget and 8 or 3.6% above March of 2021. Cath lab inpatient cases uh, at 110 were 4 or 3.8% above budget, but 3 or 2.7% below March of 2021. Our cath lab outpatient cases at 123 were 16 or 15% excuse me, above budget and 11 or 9.8% above March of 2021. I'm moving on to the breakdown of the cath lab activity. Cardiac cases were below budget by 16 or 15%, but 6 or 7.1% uh, 7 above March of 2021. And uh, Chris did state uh, we had budgeted for another interventional cardiologist and uh, we do have one that will be starting in June. So it was a little bit later, as we know, with the pandemic, recruitment has definitely uh, slowed down. It's been a little bit more challenging, but we do have a new cardiologist that is joining Washington Township Medical Foundation in, uh, in June. Our non-vascular interventional radiology cases were above budget by 16 or 27.1% and 14 or 23% above March of 2021. Peripheral vascular cases were above budget by 11 or 25%, but 20 or 26.7% below, below March of 2021. We also had a busy month for the neurointerventional radiology cases. They were above budget by 9 and 8 above uh, March of 2021. Uh, moving on to our deliveries, that was uh, a little bit slower this month in terms of deliveries uh, for March were 110 which were below budget by 21 or 16%, uh, and they were 8 or 7.8% above March of 2021. So we're continuing to, to look and watch uh, the deliveries uh, and how, how they are trending. Moving on to non-ER outpatient trends, our non-emergency outpatient visits at 8,606 were above budget by 931 or 12.1%. And we're above March of 2021 by 601 or 7.5%. So we had, we're very busy. Um, the areas that we saw increases, x-ray visits at 1,990 were above budget by 373 or 23.1% and 6% above the prior year. Our cardiac rehab visits continue to increase. Uh, they were at 770 which was above the budget by 258 or 50% and 36% above the prior year. Uh, however, visits were still about 6.5% below the pre-COVID average, and, but uh, continuing to, to make uh, progress towards that number. Uh, infusion center visits at 494 were above budget by 63 or 14.6% and 27.6% uh, above the prior year. And lastly, uh, as you heard from Dr. Cotta uh, in our outpatient uh, diabetes education visits, uh, they were at 306, which were above budget by 50 or 19.5% and 12.5% above the prior year. So you can see that uh, I know they've been working on uh, in, uh, increasing those referrals. 
Moving on to our emergency room visits, they were at 4,202, which were above budget by 60 or 1.4 percent, and 22.9 percent above the prior year. All right, moving on to the gross revenue recap. Um, uh, surgery, surgeries were higher than budget, as we talked about, by 89 or 25.2 percent, and there were more neuro and cardiac cases driving revenue higher than budget by 10.1 million or 29.2 percent, so a, a large driver in our uh, gross revenue increase. Our cath lab revenue was at 693,000 or 5.1 percent. And cases were above budget by 20 or 9.4 percent, but there were fewer cardiac uh, cases driving the average revenue per case down. Looking at our emergency room visits, they were above budget by 60, and the acuity was high, driving emergency room revenue up by 640,000 or 5.7 percent. Uh, deliveries, as uh, we said, were below budget by 21 uh, or 16 percent, but the revenue was up by 69,000 or 2.1%. Um, C-sections at 40 were above budget by, uh, uh, by uh, were above the budget of 32 by eight cases or 25%, which uh, drove up the average revenue per case. Our uh, ancillary services revenue were pr pretty much consistent with budget, and looking at our patient days, they were below budget by 2.7%. Uh, and was below room and board revenue was below budget by 1.5 million or 3.6 percent. All right, uh, moving on to our preliminary payer mix uh, for the month of March. Uh, Government-sponsored patient revenue made up 72.8 percent of total gross revenue. This is lower than the budget by 0.5 percent and lower than the prior year by 2.3 percent. Uh, HMO was 2.5% of gross revenue, which was below the budget of 2.6% and lower than the prior year percentage of 2.8% of gross revenue. Um, we did see higher PPO. PPO was at 23.6% uh, of gross revenue, which was above the budget of 22.2% and higher than the pr prior year percentage of 21.1% of gross revenue. And lastly, our private pay uh, was at 1.1% of gross revenue, uh, which was below budget of 1.9%, but higher than the prior year percentage of 1% of gross revenue. So. Uh, then moving on to our uh, productivity indicators, um, our productive FTEs were above the budget by 5.4 or 0.4% at 1,419 .5. Our non-productive FTEs were above budget by 59.5 or 48.7% at 181.8. So total FTEs of 1,601.3 were above the budget by 64.9 or 4.2%. Uh, looking at our productive FTEs per adjusted occupied bed, um, uh, they're looking those this statistics looking good at 5.01, which was lower than the budget of. 5.90 by 15.1% and lower than the prior year of 5.87 uh, by 14.7%. Then the total FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 5.66 were lower than the budget of 6.41 by 11.7% and lower than the prior year of 6.47 by 12.5%. I do just want to talk a little bit about um, situation that we'll see also that will be impacting um, that impacted our FTEs and will be impacting um, salary and wages for uh, for the month. Um, on February 9th of 2022, the state mandated that 80 hours of additional sick pay would be provided to benefited and unbenefited employees who test positive retroactive to January 1 of 2022. Uh, we did review which employees had tested positive and had used accrued ETO during their time away from work or took the time as unpaid. In March, uh, we retroactively restored these benefited employees' accrued ETO and reclassified the wages to unaccrued uh, COVID sick pay. Uh, we also paid the unbenefited employees who took the time unpaid for this mandated benefit. Uh, so this resulted in the recognition of additional $504,000 in salaries expense in March, as well as the recognition of 42 additional non-productive FTEs. So that, you can see, that was one of the factors driving up our, our non-productive, too. 
So just wanted to make sure um, everybody was aware of that, and we'll see it in the financials uh, next uh, when Chris presents uh, March. All right, uh, moving on to preliminary outpatient statistics. So uh, the Washington Township Medical Foundation clinic visits were below budget in March by 456 or 2.5% at 18,002, but were 4% of visits above March of 2021. Uh, some of the areas that we were uh, below was in the intensivist visits, cardiology, as, as, which we talked about earlier in terms of having um, thought we would have a new interventional cardiologist, and then also vascular. Moving down to DEVCO outpatient visits of 2,475 were below budget by 16 for the month of March and 47 below the March, month of March 2021 visits. Uh, Washington Outpatient Rehab Center was above budget by 118 or 7.9%. Um, Washington Radiation Oncology Center treatments were below budget by 167. Uh, we, are, we do have had a number of consults and we do have a number of patients that are, are waiting to be treated after they have their other procedures. Um, Washington Outpatient Surgery Center uh, was, had an increase of 71 visits over budget, or 13.2%, and this increase was primarily driven by uh, GI cases and general surgery cases. And then lastly, Ohlone College Student Health Center uh, was below budget by 38 uh, visits. Um, they, Ohlone has gone to a hybrid model, um, but they still have a number of of classes that uh, people are doing virtually. So we've seen the, the lower visits um, from the Student Health Center, but the, the staff at the Student Health Center have been really busy doing a lot of other general education um, with the students and helping out in, in many different ways. All right, um, moving on to our key financial statistics. <clears throat> our day's cash on hand for March ended at 158 days, a decrease of one day from last month. Uh, Mainly that was due to the following factors, our quarterly pension and OPEB contribution of $2.9 million, which is about two days. Uh, we had capital support to the Peninsula Surgery Center of about a million or one day. Uh, we saw a lower market value of investments uh, of approximately $2.1 million or two days. Uh, we did as you, uh, have some higher average operating costs of about $2.6 million or two days. And uh, these cash outflows were partially offset by the increase in patient collections of about 7.6 million or six days. So that uh, the stronger collections really helped to offset uh, those other um, contributions that we had to do uh, and expenses. Then moving on to our days in accounts receivable, as of March 31st, they were 64.6, a decrease of 4.1 days from the prior month. Um, and I do want to say I did find out what it was, uh, what it is today, and today we are actually at 63.8. So um, we've continued to make uh, some good progress. Also in March, we had the highest collections in over two years at 46.3 uh, million, which um, definitely helped to drive the accounts receivable days down. And then lastly, uh, there were 212,000 in charity care adjustments in the month of March compared to the prior month of 145.6. Then lastly, I do want to give the, uh, the year-to-date um, summary from the homeless patient activity. Uh, fiscal year-to-date March, there were 1,511 patient encounters representing 802 homeless patients, of which 234 had more than one encounter during the period. Uh, the estimated total unreimbursed cost for fiscal year to date is about $4.1 million. All right, that is uh, my report for March of 2022. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, we have uh, an action item. Do you want to uh, address that one, Kimberly, please? Uh, yes, um, on the agenda is a request for purchase of six merge workstations and software in order for the radiologist to read from home. Um, I think that it's, it's, we've really seen a change in uh, what is happening in the ra field of radiology. The ability to have the radiologist review cases remotely 
via teleradiology and to di dictate final reports from an off-site location is a capability that is becoming widespread in the industry and is necessary to recruit and retain strong radiologists. This offers multiple advantages to the healthcare system. The capability reduces turnaround time for final reports and increases radiologist efficiency at a time where there is a shortage of radiologists. Um, currently, when cases are read by our radiologists from home, they submit the reports that are only preliminary. The radiologists then reread them the next day in order to provide a final report uh, to the ordering physician. Um, this is, can be often inefficient and redundant. So dictating the final reports the next day uh, takes a significant amount of time, which would be better spent on reading and turning around current new cases. So the capability that uh, we're recommending will allow them to, to dictate these final reports. Uh, with this capability, as I said, final reports of teleradiology cases can be dictated by a radiologist on call and on the weekends. So we're recommending moving forward with the purchase of six remote reading stations with the necessary software for the radiologist to be able to read remotely. The cost of the reading stations will be $116,549.82 plus tax and shipping. This includes the hardware plus the software necessary to perform the reads. Um, this has been reviewed and approved by our information systems uh, department and so the request is not to exceed 131,000. Uh, this was not included in the fiscal year 2021-22 fixed capital asset budget. However, given that there is such a shortage of radiologists and we are uh, very much struggling with recruiting new radiologists and retaining ours that we feel it's important to move forward with this at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the solution. Um, may I have a motion on this action item, please? Bernie, you're muted. I, I apologize. For Madam me. President, I move that the board approve the request to purchase six merge workstations and software. Thank you. Second. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Wallace. Uh, a roll call, please. Director Yee. Aye. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Thank you very much. So that passes. Uh, announcements, Kimberly. I do have a, a couple of announcements. I want to start with April Employee of the Month. Um, very excited to introduce uh, Felisa Fillard. She's uh, Executive Assistant 2 in Executive Services, and she is the April Employee of the Month. Um, when the April Employee of the Month award was announced, Felisa Fillard was stunned to hear her name, but she was only she was the only person in the room who was surprised. <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> Felisa co-workers in executive services know that she projects a warm, professional, and cheerful attitude and is always willing to step up and accept additional responsibilities when needed. They, uh, that has included fulfill, filling in consecutively for a business assistant and a department coordinator who needed to be out for several weeks. Raised in the Bay Area, Felisa held several enjoyable jobs, but when it came time to choose something that would offer her an opportunity to build a career upon, she looked no further than Washington Hospital. In 2017, Felisa joined our healthcare system as a clerk in the emergency department. It was there that she witnessed firsthand the power of our patient first ethic. She says, in the emergency department, there can be joy, but there often is stress, concern, and sometimes grief. I saw my coworkers treat people with care and kindness. In 2019, uh, the Executive Services Department welcomed Felisa as an executive assistant where she covered responsibilities for the reception area and supported the office of the CEO. During the past three years, she has developed her skills and has recently taken on the role as exec executive assistant too for the chief of systems operations and support. One of the many reasons Felisa enjoys working in executive services is the opportunity to support those who drive the continued success of our hospital and the patient first ethic each day and every day. A native of San Francisco, Felisa currently lives in Hayward. She has an 11-year-old daughter that keeps her busy with craft projects and fitness challenges. 
Uh, it was very, we were very happy to recognize Felisa Ballard as our April Employee of the Month. Yay. <laughs> All right, um, just a, a couple of announcements in terms of uh, health promotions and outreach. Um, I know Dr. Soleil mentioned that we are continuing to give our uh, COVID vaccines and in, on March 31st uh, started to vaccinate employee, employees and community members who are 50 years of age or older with second booster doses. As of uh, Monday, April 11th, a total of 86,922 COVID vaccine doses have been administered. So we're continuing to, to do that. Um, in terms of health and wellness, on Tuesday, March 22nd, at 6.30 p.m., Dr. Mark Shu, a urologist, presented overactive bladder causes, symptoms, and treatment on Facebook Live and YouTube. We had 180 community members participated in the live event, and since then, 855 additional people accessed the presentation on one of our social media channels. So it was very good in terms of that reach. <coughs> Excuse me. On Tuesday, April 19th, these are upcoming health promotions and community outreach events. On April 19th at uh, 3.30 p.m., Dr. Rajiv Seigel, neurosurgeon who we heard earlier, will present treatments and procedures for common spine conditions on Facebook Live and YouTube. On Wednesday, April 27th at 3.30 p.m., Desiree Mehrabian, a certified diabetes educator, will present diabetes self-management, lesser known factors impacting blood glucose levels, and that will be on Facebook Live and YouTube. And then on Tuesday, May 3rd at 3.30, Jessica Miller, certified childbirth educator, will present newborn Parent Boot Camp on Facebook Live and YouTube. Then lastly, on April 19th at 5.30 p.m., Christy Caracapa, our Health Insurance Information Services Coordinator, will present information on programs and services available at Washington Hospital to members of the Community Advisory and Engagement Board at the Fremont Family Resource Center. Uh, lastly, I just want to say that the foundation is sold out um, for our upcoming 35th annual golf tournament. So it will be held on May 5th in support of surgical services. Um, registration begins at 9 a.m. with an 11 a.m. shotgun start and, and a post-tournament reception from 4 to 5 p.m. So I just uh, so we're looking forward to seeing everybody out on the golf course. So that is my report, uh, my announcements for this evening. I think Director Wallace have a his hand. Thanks. Might have a question. Okay. Yes. I'm oh, sorry, what was that? I missed it. I think Mike Wallace has a question. Oh, Dr. No. Wallace. No, yeah. I, I didn't I, I didn't hear somebody said something, I couldn't catch it. Oh. He raised the hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have need for a closed session this evening, Kimberly? There is no need. Okay. No. Very good. Well, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. I thank you all for your participation. Have a blessed week and weekend. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. Good thank evening. you. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.